So, in a previous video where I was making book recommendations, one of the books I highly recommended was Aldous Huxley's The Perennial Philosophy. It's the book that I got exposed to early on in my uh, sort of exploration of spiritual traditions, and it's one that I have, you know, recommended and given to people uh, over the years. One of the things that recommends it is not only the verbiage that he provides in terms of his own perspective on this philosophy of sort of mysticism that exists within various religious traditions, but he also gives quotes. And this was one of the first places where I discovered quotes regarding the uh, system of Mahayana Buddhism. So in this video, I want to share a few of those quotes from Huxley's perennial philosophy. And the first one is from the Lakavatara Sutra, where he says the Lakavatara Sutra um, was the scripture which the founder of Zen Buddhism expressly recommended to his first disciples. So the quote is thus, those who vainly reason without understanding the truth are lost in the jungle of the Vijnanas, which are the various forms of relative knowledge, running about here and there and trying to justify their views of ego substance. The self realized in your inmost consciousness appears in its purity. This is the Tathagatagarbha, literally the Buddha womb, which is not the realm of those given over to mere reasoning, Pure in its own nature and free from the category of finite and infinite, universal mind is the undefiled Buddha womb, which is wrongly apprehended by sentient beings. So these are perhaps some different uh, translations of some of the terms as compared to the Suzuki translation, which I've been reciting on a on an unabridged basis. But um, certainly the Lanka is a scripture very much worthy of study, reflection, contemplation, and so forth. A Buddhist text, which I have not frankly gotten into very much, uh, is the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I know that Thurman has made a, uh, a translation, which I've heard friends of mine recommend. Uh, but uh, and here uh, Huxley gives a quote from it when he refers to this uh, excerpt as a part of a formula addressed by the Tibetan priest to a person in the act of death. O oh, nobly born, the time has now come for thee to seek the path. Thy breathing is about to cease. In the past, Thy teacher has set thee face to face with the clear light, and now thou art about to experience it in its reality, in the bardo state, which Huxley refers to as the intermediate state immediately following death, in which the soul is judged, or rather judges itself, by choosing, in accord with the character formed during its life on earth, what sort of an afterlife it shall have. Going on with the quote, in this bardo state, all things are like the cloudless sky, and the naked, immaculate intellect is like unto a translucent void, without circumference or center. At this moment, know thou thyself, and abide in that state. I, too, at this time, am setting thee face to face." In the section of the book where he's talking about God incarnate, so to speak, uh, he gives a quote from the Tavija or Taviga Sutta, which must be from the Pali Canon and is not one that I'm familiar with, but here it goes. Then the Blessed One spoke and said, No, Vasetha, that from time to time a Tathagata is born into the world, a fully enlightened one, blessed and worthy, abounding in wisdom and goodness, happy with knowledge of the worlds, unsurpassed as a guide to erring mortals, a teacher of God and men, a blessed Buddha. He thoroughly understands this universe as though he saw it face to face. The truth does he proclaim both in its letter and in its spirit, lovely in its origin, lovely in its progress, lovely in its consummation. A higher life doth he make known in all its purity and in all its perfectness. And of course, when he's expressing the basic theme throughout the book, namely, that art thou, uh, he has to quote Hui Neng, who says, When not enlightened, Buddhas are no other than ordinary beings. When there is enlightenment, ordinary beings at once turn into Buddhas. 
And along a similar vein, the Zen master or Chan master Huang Po said, The mind is no other than the Buddha, and Buddha is no other than sentient being. When mind assumes the form of a sentient being, it has suffered no decrease. When it has become a Buddha, it has added nothing to itself. And here's another quote by Huang Po. When followers of Zen fail to go beyond the world of their senses and thoughts, all their doings and movements are of no significance. But when the senses and thoughts are annihilated, all the passages to universal mind are blocked, and no entrance then becomes possible. The original mind is to be recognized along with the working of the senses and thoughts, only it does not belong to them, nor yet is it independent of them. Do not build up your views upon your senses and thoughts. Do not base your understanding upon your senses and thoughts. But at the same time, do not seek the mind away from your senses and thoughts. Do not try to grasp reality by rejecting your senses and thoughts. When you are neither attached to nor detached from them, then you enjoy your perfect, unobstructed freedom. Then you have your seat of enlightenment. And back to the Lankavatara. There are four kinds of dhyana, or spiritual disciplines. What are these four? They are first, the dhyana practiced by the ignorant. Second, the dhyana devoted to the examination of meaning. Third, the dhyana with suchness for its object. Fourth, the dhyana of the tathagatas, or buddhas. What is meant by the dhyana practiced by the ignorant? It is the one resorted to by the yogins who exercise themselves in the disciplines of Shravakas and Pratyaka Buddhas, which Huxley refers to as contemplatives and solitary Buddhas of the Hinayana school, who perceive that there is no ego substance, that the body is a shadow and a skeleton which is transient, impure and full of suffering, persistently cling to these notions which are regarded as just so and not otherwise and who, starting from them, advance by stages until they reach the cessation, where there are no thoughts. This is called the dhyana practiced by the ignorant. What then is the dhyana devoted to the examination of meaning? It is the one practiced by those who, having gone beyond the egolessness of things, beyond individuality and generality, beyond the untenability of such ideas as self, other, and both, which are held by the philosophers, proceed to examine and follow up the meaning of the various aspects of bodhisattvahood. This is the dhyana devoted to the examination of meaning. What is the dhyana with tathata, or suchness, as its object? When the yogin recognizes that the discrimination of the two forms of egolessness is mere imagination, and that where he establishes himself in the reality of suchness, there is no rising of discrimination. This I call the dhyana with suchness as its object. What is the dhyana of the Tathagata? When the yogin, entering upon the stage of Tathagatahood, and abiding in the triple bliss, characterizing self-realization attained by noble wisdom, devotes himself for the sake of all beings to the accomplishment of incomprehensible works, this I call the Dhyana of the Tathagata. And here's another quote from what I believe to be a Chan master, although I'm not familiar with Mo Tzu. He said, The Shravaka, or hearer, fails to perceive that mind, as it is in itself, has no stages, no causation. Disciplining himself in the cause, he has attained the result and abides in the samadhi of emptiness for ever so many eons. However enlightened in this way, the Shravaka is not at all on the right track. And here's a little quote from the Pruna Buddha Sutra. Again, I'm not familiar with it, but here we go. When enlightenment is perfected, a bodhisattva is free from the bondage of things, but does not seek to be delivered from things. Samsara, or the world of becoming, is not hated by him, nor is nirvana loved. When perfect enlightenment shines, it is neither bondage nor deliverance. And back to the Lankavatara with reference to the eighth stage of bodhisattvahood. 
The Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, when they reach the eighth stage of the Bodhisattva's discipline, become so intoxicated with the bliss of mental tranquility that they fail to realize that the visible world is nothing but the mind. They are still in the realm of individuation. Their insight is not yet pure. The Bodhisattvas, on the other hand, are alive to their original vows, flowing out of the all-embracing love that is in their hearts. They do not enter into nirvana as a state separate from the world of becoming. They know that the visible world is nothing but a manifestation of mind itself. And here's another from Hui Neng. A conscious being alone understands what is meant by moving. To those not endowed with consciousness, the moving is unintelligible. If you exercise yourself in the practice of keeping your mind unmoved, the immovable you gain is that of one who has no consciousness. If you are desirous for the truly immovable, the immovable is in the moving itself. And this immovable is the truly immovable one. There is no seat of Buddhahood where there is no consciousness. Mark well how varied are the aspects of the immovable one, and know that the first reality is immovable. Only when this reality is attained is the true working of suchness understood. And here is Ha Quin expressing the Zen ideal. Abiding with the non-particular, which is in particulars, going or returning, they remain forever unmoved. Taking hold of the non-thought which lies in thoughts, in their every act they hear the voice of truth. How boundless the sky of contemplation! How transparent the moonlight of the fourfold wisdom! As the truth reveals itself in its eternal tranquility, this very earth is the lotus land of purity, and this body is the body of the Buddha. So let me close with this. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Bodhs.